welcome uh, everybody. We are thrilled to have you here. My name is uh, Jason Lane. I have the great honor of serving as the Dean of the School of Education uh, here at the University uh, at Albany. And we're delighted to have you joining us for our weekly Ed Trends uh, session. Uh, my thanks to Dr. Jerry Rivera, Rivera Wilson for her uh, work in continuing to uh, set up these amazing uh, discussions uh, for our uh, community as well. Uh, I also want to uh, just give a shout out and thanks to uh, the Lassinger uh, Center and uh, Kathy Kavanaugh for working with us today to, to establish this uh, this conversation, as well as uh, our, our friends at Cognia uh, for their work uh, as well. And so all of this is made better through collaboration. And so we're delighted to be able to do that. Uh, these uh, Ed Trends uh, started as an offspring of the School of Education uh, when uh, COVID first hit and we all had to move remote. Uh, and the School of Education at Albany is, is noted for its online education. And so we decided to pivot and, and, and build from that uh, as a way to uh, engage with our K-12 partners on thinking through about how we can more effectively uh, ensure learning of, of all of our students during this most unusual uh, of times. Uh, so EdTrends uh, was born and uh, out of an idea first of a website, which we call remoteed.org, which is a collated site of about 1,500 free uh, educational resources that have been vetted by our graduate students and faculty members, organized by grade level uh, and, uh, and subject matter. And now Jerry tells me that uh, you can go on and, and rank those on our site. So you can go on and vote for what's good and, and, and maybe what isn't quite as, as effective. So I encourage you to go onto the site and uh, check that out. Uh, for the session two, uh, uh, you can earn CTLE credit if you're a New York State teacher and need your CTLE uh, requirements. And if you're interested in doing that, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to, to Jerry Rivera Wilson and uh, she'll make sure uh, that happens. Next slide. Upcoming, uh, we have uh, continuing in our online learning experiences, some exciting uh, sessions uh, really uh, focusing on uh, remote learning and how do we make those effective. And so you can see here the lineup, uh, well, one today and, and one coming up on January 27th. Uh, hopefully you can turn in for that one as well. So moving on. Uh, we also have our book study dates. Uh, for those of you who are able to join us uh, previously, we kicked off uh, our book study on grading for equity. I think now more than ever, uh, thinking about the effective use of grading uh, in the environments to support student learning uh, is critical uh, as we are in, in this time of, of really sort of unique learning opportunities. So hopefully you can join us for that, that book study. Now, uh, I wanted to get through that quickly so we get to the meat of the matter, and I'm really thrilled uh, to be able to turn uh, this over now to Ka Dr. Kathy Cavanaugh uh, as the moderator, uh, who is at the University of Florida's Lastinger Center for Learning. And so, Kathy, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason, and thanks, Jerry, um, for making this possible and really for the vision of this series. Um, it's, it's exciting to be, uh, to be a part of it. And I'm really thrilled with the, the group that we've assembled here today. Um, our, our topic is effective learning experiences. So we're really focused on teaching and learning today. And um, we're focused on school districts, what school districts are doing um, in terms of guiding principles um, for the shifts that they're making or, and have made um, to online learning. And we've got two district leaders with us and we'll be joined um, by Keisha Ray who works nationally. So we'll, we'll begin with a district perspective and, and then we'll kind of broaden out to um, a national perspective. So uh, good afternoon, everyone who's with us. I, I think we're, we're from North, across North America but um, a time neutral greeting to anyone who's not in North America where it's the afternoon. Um, we're excited that you're here with us as well. Um, so uh, I want to introduce uh, the guests that we have right now. Um, we've got Rob Dixon, who is Chief Information Officer at Wichita Public Schools. Um, lots of exciting things have been happening um, in Wichita, even before remote learning, but, um, but especially I think in the last year. And then we have Dr. Phil Neufeld, who is Executive Officer over Information Technology at Fresno Unified School District, um, which also has a rich and recent history um, of, of digital learning. So um, I'm excited for you uh, to learn from these inspiring leaders. And uh, given the, um, the world that we live in right now, I'm kind of seeing today's session as somewhat of a light in an education tunnel. Um, we're focused on what's working, what's effective, um, what, what folks have learned um, and what we can learn from them. So um, if we go ahead to the next slide, we'll, we'll be ready to, to start the conversation. So, 
I wanted to begin with, um, with Phil and Rob thinking about over the past year almost as they've tuned and refined online learning experiences in their districts, um, what has worked well um, and if we think in particular about um, the, sort of the, the theory and the practice of online learning, we know that connection is essential. Um, and especially at a time of uh, national trauma, worldwide trauma, that feeling of being supported is also incredibly important. Um, so for this one, um, maybe Rob, you could kick off and, and tell us what's been happening in Wichita um, that's helped everyone to feel connected and supported, especially what teachers are doing. Sure, sure. So uh, just to start out, kind of give you a landscape of Wichita, we're the largest school district in Kansas. And uh, whenever you think about how we entered the school year in the fall, all of our secondary students, which is about uh, 25,000 secondary students, they went fully remote. And then um, our elementary students, there was a mixture of about uh, 13,000 elementary students that stayed face to face. And then uh, about 8,500 that went remote at that time. Now, uh, in December last month, we went full remote for a time. And uh, just today, we, we started bringing a couple of our elementary students back face-to-face. Uh, -face. So today would be the first day for some of those students coming back. So you see there's a, the, the term pivot in our district is done quite a bit. And so um, one of the things I think being connected to students is making sure that we're leveling out that playing field. So we, we distributed devices, we distributed internet, uh, distributed internet to about uh, a little over 14,000 families uh, during the time of uh, the fall. And so um, thinking about students and thinking about what went well, I think we connected with kids well. If you look at, uh, we use a data platform on the back called Class Insights inside of Teams. And so when you looked at the trajectory at the very first, our teachers were connecting with students almost synchronously throughout the entire day. And you look at the amount of time that was spent in meetings, it was a significant amount. I would say to the tune of, six and a half hours of that day was done in online meetings. Now, when you think about what's uh, right inside of that online meeting setting, I've, I'm, I'm also in charge of the virtual school inside of the school district. Uh, you understand that that's probably not great uh, pedagogy and processing for a student in an online environment. And so you've seen that scale back to about three and a half hours now uh, per day that you're seeing students engage with that. And so when I think about students, there's been an evolution of that uh, as you think of digital literacy, which the digital literacy level of our uh, staff was probably extremely low at the time. And they've naturally had to uh, progress in that as we've gone through. And whenever I think of families, and I'll post this link into uh, the chat, um, when I think of families, we've had to start to uh, bring programming to our families. So we have Parent University that we introduced uh, last year during our uh, springtime when COVID hit. And we've continued that uh, progress and progression throughout uh, this whole term. So every month we have something that focuses on the well-being of our students, knowing that our parents and our students are probably working and learning in the same environment and what that needs to look like and how we can assist them, as well as we've changed our whole support model for how we support technology and how we support curriculum in that and offering uh, longer hours and offering uh, more places for them to come to to get uh, support for both uh, their child as well as them many in many instances. So um, for educators, uh, we constantly are doing sessions and I, I appreciate the state of Kansas giving us an entire month. When, whenever we started in August, our governor delayed our start until September 9th. So we did uh, about 168 professional development sessions to get parents or get our educators ready. And then throughout that, um, I was able to steal Diane Smokorowski, who's an amazing educator who's known nationally. Uh, she does every month a virtual uh, field trip session for students uh, today, we're doing one with a puppeteer out of Atlanta, and so for elementary kids. And so I think, you know, 
so much of that is just melding the environments of different types of exposure to different types of learning. Uh, th those are those are fantastic examples, and I, I just want to respond to a couple of things that you said. I, I love that you, as a district, thought that quantity of um, live connection is not necessarily correlated with the quality of the experience, and and it sounds like you gave a lot of thought to that because that's a that's a pretty big shift. Um, go ahead. I, I was going to say, you know, it's also helped us to realize what look fors look like, starting to use mm -hmm. data. So now that you know what's happening in the classroom based upon a data point, you can now be more prescriptive and better in knowing what classrooms to hop into virtually. So mm -hmm. uh, before, when, when that was face-to-face, -face, you had an assumption based upon maybe walking down a hallway as far as what was happening. Now I know what activities are happening with students in that assignment area. Yeah, that's a great point. You don't have just snapshots. You've got, um you know, like live video of what's happening. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, and I, I like what you said about support as well, because, you know, when we think about online, remote and distance learning, we think about breaking down um, walls of time and space, but that means we also need everyone to feel supported across a greater range of, of time and space. So, and that's, that's also, that can also be a challenge. It sounds like you've made that work. And uh, the other, the last comment is you, you really got a gift of time for professional development. Um, that's amazing. Did you create, I just want to follow up really quickly and, but not, not too much if you want to say this later, but I'm wondering if you created professional learning communities, um, like what was the centerpiece of how, to, how you use that time and how you sustained that professional growth? Yep. So we, we created an entire site that uh, housed a lot of that uh, content as well as started to develop uh, cohorts within the district to help uh, kind of sustain best practice. Because remember, we're defining what a new normal looks like coming back. Yeah. And I think those cohorts are helping us in PLCs and in that uh, continuous improvement of helping us define some of those strategies that maybe we need to change. Nice. All right, thanks a lot, Rob. All right. Phil, I know that there's so much going on in Fresno and you've got a, you've also got kind of a, a rich, rich history. So um, yeah. what can you tell us that you've learned uh, most recently um, about connection and support in your district? Sure. I'm going to give a little background because uh, I think it, I see this as COVID as not a detour, but an, a continued on-ramp on our highway uh, in terms of our journey. But I love, Rob, your point. We wouldn't have made this uh, note a year or two ago of hop into a virtual classroom, right? So um, yeah, in, in, in spring, during the shift to what we may have called crisis distance learning for us um, that came in early February, probably earlier than it might have needed to occur based on you know, the, the disease spread, um, our district honored the assets and strengths of our teachers and students by shifting to online learning rather than choosing a paper-based or a distance learning model. And it was because we had begun several years uh, earlier to reimagine learning that included critical knowledge, skills, competencies, student wellness, and agency. We had invested in several improvement initiatives uh, with our frame, you know, with, with our frames like graduate profile, but making sure those changes occurred in context and I'll uh, pertain later to some of the conversation we'll have around frameworks, um, you know, with language that teachers understood. And uh, one example is our personalized learning initiative. We started that in 2016. Five years later, there are over a thousand teachers who have either participated in a learning cohort or in a, a school-based design um, rollout of personalized blended learning at their, across their schools. So that's 35 of those schools. That's out of our 3,800 teachers. We've got about 70,000 students. And we also move student computers into classrooms um, and those students got better at doing things. You know, five, six years ago, we had teachers really nervous, but can they log on? How long will it take? No longer a question. You know, can they pivot between Teams and, and OneNote, uh, sorry, and, and, and like Wonders or GoMath in the instant? Yes, you know, that's where we're at now. And, and so our students thrived and we saw proportional gains for all students and, and gains in the state test. But more importantly, they were having skills that are looked at uh, favorably in, in higher education and, and industry. So um, 
the when when February came around, our, our district did shift to provide uh, some of the necessary basic uh, and basic conditions like food, laptops, hotspots. Um, we also continued to provide professional learning that was effective. Like, why are we making this shift? You know, experiential so they could experience what the shift looked like and actionable so they could take it back with them. Over 1,700 of our educators uh, participated on average two to five times. So they came back quite often. Uh, and we had uh, over 100 webinars in spring of 2020, uh, COVID time. <laughs> and the, um, then they brought that information back into their, their PLCs. We also developed a competency-based guide for teachers as they dove into the deep end of online learning. So I want to connect better with my students. What are some strategies and what are some tools like uh, Flipgrid? Um, I want to make sure students know what they're learning today. What tools do I use? Okay, I can use Class Notebook, you know. Um, we had um, early adopted Microsoft Teams and uh, what we were really pleasantly surprised to see, because it was based on teacher choice. This was not a top-down uh, LMS you know, selection, but it was teacher choice as part of the personalized learning initiative as well. But uh, when spring came, we actually, and, and earlier than that, so it was just one of those uh, wonderful serendipitous pieces. We had our high schools uh, and leadership there go, you know, this notion about you pick whatever platform you want, it's not good for students, it's not good for the families. And that sort of happened wonderfully last in the fall before COVID came. And so we had high adoption of teams across our system. And to Rob, to your point, you know, really we've got some great uh, leader insight and teacher insight data signals inside of teams. So you could sort of see what the engagement was. It was really high in the high 90%, but it was teachers choosing to reduce the ambiguity and the complexity of what education was about to focus on the learning. So we also work with uh, Clever to get data to, so we could see what the levels of participation, engagement were and where interventions were necessary. Like why isn't, it was amazing. We had principals like out of our 630 students, I know two who right now don't have a hotspot or a laptop or have some trauma going on right now. So they were really tracking that thing, those things carefully. In summer, um, we shifted our attention more towards families and students. Um, our superintendent led, led our region to continue addressing basic human needs like meals through the summer. We created a call center in places to pick up and exchange technology. It's now sort of the, the, our new norm. Um, and uh, we shifted our attention to virtual schooling. There's a nuance there that online schooling or online classrooms never really um, uh, haven't paid as much attention to, but like to, to Rob's point, how do you as a, as a principal or a para or a co-teacher hop into another meeting uh, with uh, another teacher and all those logistics, how do we uh, learn, look for discipline issues and how do we have culturally responsive appropriate uh, interventions in the digital space where we may not have the levers we want uh, and we also don't want to take the computer away from the student. That, we don't want to cut off their connections or their learning. So we had some real cross uh, uh, departmental conversations that we probably wouldn't have had before just to navigate the new uh, environment. Um, we brought on things like gaggle for student safety uh, to make sure that we were catching students who are, are looking to self-harm or harm others uh, or, or weren't or needed an opportunity to learn how to have digital conversations appropriately. So the, uh, a lot of new tools, you know, we brought on uh, Nearpod, Turnitin at a district level. So it was a, a wonderful shift to digital, but also because we've been doing digital for a while, it wasn't about the, the tool. It was about how to use the tool to enhance your learning and to, to, to create new things. Um, our professional learning, um, really focused on a progression because this was like jumping into the deep end, but how do you instead say, how do you start in the shallow and with your students and with your, with your teachers, uh, how do you start there and move forward? So start with connecting student, teachers and students, exposing students to the different tools. And then this was true in spring, but also in fall, um, going to the progression then of routine, you know, getting students used to new routines or helping them understand old routines that were in new garb, you know, because they're at home. But guys, the furniture didn't change. It's still the same routine, right? And then getting to authentic learning uh, and that progression and, and those sort of notions of progression, right next step for you journey, 
that really, I think, helped educators, families, uh, and, and staff move forward in a way that was growth mindset, yeah, but also manageable, right? Uh, and it, we continue to, to, to emphasize uh, personalization, depth of learning, but also just the, the, the reality uh, of that these virtual operations take a little more energy. Our union ended up and, and, uh, and, and leadership ended up having a mix of synchronous and asynchronous time. So Rob, we ended up having uh, less asynchronous time than you had. Um, did require us to think of some new ways to track those things and make sure we're in compliance with the state. Um, but I think it was a good mix. We have gone um, in this, this during the last fall semester to more, uh, actually let's stay the same. We're now in the spring semester to, to doing a little more synchronous time. Um, so, but to your point, it, it's one of those things that we're having to learn as we go. Um, yeah. And so I think that gives you some of the sense um, uh, our community of practice was interesting. It, it's formed both within the webinars. So we always left time for breakouts and small groups. And near, in, that was in, sp in spring, we already started to say, okay, it doesn't need to be us telling, it needs to be us asking. What have you done recently? And having folks share that out. And it really, you end up hearing stories of a you know, second grade teacher reaching out to a fifth grade teacher or a high school teacher reaching out to a elementary teacher at a different school entirely to say, how do I do this? And, and people sharing that practice. And I think before we start the webinar, uh, Kathy, Rob and I were talking about our velocity has increased dramatically um, and, and our uh, necessity, but also our ability to collaborate because you can't all show up in a conference room across departments. We pushed out, uh, uh, we all of a sudden had, you know, we went from like 40 people need a virtual private network connection to the next day, it's almost like uh, 4,000 people, right? Within a week, we had uh, 60,000 to 70,000 computers connected to our network from a management standpoint, because we, you know, it, we've got to make sure they're working, they're, they're protected from viruses. And we moved all that within a short time period and those have never come back. And so fortunately we were able to do those things as well, but numerous changes that we've had to make along the way to make sure that things work and they continue to work. Yeah. I want to thank think, you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. And, and Rob, too, actually, for starting with equity and, and letting us know what you did um, as districts to make sure that, that everyone was included. Um, that's, you know, that, that's the foundation. Um, Phil, you made me think about uh, what Fullen said about coherence because right. you created a new shared language across yeah. your district, you know, yeah. with staff and, and students and families. You've got a new shared context, a new shared environment. Right. You know, people are, are together for the first time in the same space and they can form yeah. communities. And so right. Um, right. you know, I think I think that there are probably some new connections among everyone um, because of bringing everyone together in that way. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said about competencies as well. So, all right. Um, so what we want to do um, is move from the, the picture that you painted of what's happening in your districts and the hard work and the sensitivity and, and the listening that you did um, and think about what's, uh, what's happening in the, what was happening in the classrooms and um, specifically um, what educators did. And so um, both, Rob, both you and Phil have been involved in virtual schooling for a while, as well as um, kind of face-to-face -face traditional schooling. So, you know, you know that some of the, the, the previous traditions and principles of distance education um, uh, kind of are founded on clear communication, um, structure, auto enough autonomy uh, to be challenging. Um, and so it sounds like you're, you're in that kind of space of blending. So um, Phil, maybe you can, you can start yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and explain a little bit about what you saw working um, from the classroom level. Yeah. Well, one thing we, uh, and it was actually neat to see uh, the union leadership work together and, and, uh, Put together a practice of, a, of adopting across our sites and it's uh, fairly well adopted a weekly week at a glance and that that was a great way to communicate with families sort of our miss in spring was yeah it's not just about the students it's about the community-based organizations the families and the students so that there's clear understanding and that week at a glance included uh, learning objectives for the week um, uh, criteria for success and what the uh, upcoming uh, learning tasks and assessments for review. So that's one piece, you know, to your point about clear communication. 
I think the other is um, we extended and adjusted our blended learning models for online teaching. We took, you know, with teachers, there's this one slide that was so powerful, which was here are the five factors for brick and mortar versus online uh, communication, uh, space, um, time, accountability, and routines. And, and the space and the time obviously were the big factors. But uh, when we talk about blended learning, it's really about taking um, learning, uh, you know, teaching strategies like whole group instruction, small group instruction, independent practice, collaboration, and find a way to, to structure and routinize that so that teachers are, and students sort of have a sense of the cadence and can make great learning happen. It's like a, a great uh, jazz uh, uh, small band when they do the, the, the things and you go, wow, that's just amazing music, but there's actually a cadence and structure that allows them to be creative, you know? Um, and then taking those things and including uh, check-ins for connections, which is something that, you know, you can take for granted in a physical classroom where you can just sort of look at someone and see, ah, they're not connecting or they're sleeping, right? But um, so finding ways to, to do those check-ins and also checking for understanding. And then with each of those strategies, um, we've actually had teachers curate in, in physical, you know, when we did physical face-to-face, -face, but they curated what the criteria for success, success was. And then uh, we similarly had them re, sort of rejigger that for what the online criteria for success is. And I think that's helpful as well. And then you map to that um, what some good practices are around that. When you go into a breakout room, do the students know what the, what the task is? Do they have the criteria for success? Do they know what the roles are? And when those things are established, the learning happens, you know? And I think that was why both in spring and in, in fall, um, having the first two weeks, which is normally what happens, but really reminding people that the first two weeks is a chance to, to, to lay out those routines. And then one um, piece I'll, I'll mention as well is I always want, within our training, we always remind teachers of what I call the beautiful jagged edges of humanity. Digital Promise calls that learner variability, right? And, and remind people that um, the learning has to be designed for students in the plural and possessive, their culture and their context. Um, so a um, online space doesn't need to just be for talking and raising the hand, but it can be for the introverts to be able to be, yes, I can just text, you know, or the English language learners, oh, I can translate it or the slower process. I get some time to look at this before I have to respond. And so coming out of spring, in our summer of professional learning, and we really started to say what worked and then what are the affordances and what can you do to leverage those things to create richer instruction? And quite frankly, I, I, we, we just had a, a we're gonna, we had a, a, some planning for next fall when things may be at a different place. And we're using the language of on-ramp as opposed to detour because what we're gonna be able to bring back with us, whether it's the, the new face-to-face -face, is it's gonna be a face-to-face -face that's still hybrid, even if everyone's in the classroom, because there are ways to honor all students and every student at the same time with what we've learned through the, this, this crisis. I mean, you, you, it, it'll, it'll be an interesting test to see kind of what sticks and um, yeah. you know what, what practices stay. I really like what you said about um, protocols and the importance of, of protocols and routines, but with differentiation embedded. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if, you know, if you just said something like that to a teacher, we're going to do online protocols with differentiation. That might have been a difficult concept, but it sounds like they, they've become masters and, yes. uh, you know, yeah. and are learning from each other. Yeah. As far as check-ins, when you talked about check-ins, did you come up with policies or guidelines or did that sort of naturally um, and organically evolve? Well, so, you know, things like, so the, the, the practice and, and, and different tools like Flipgrid and such, what, what allows for students to show up in ways that are authentic, that yeah. aren't forced? We yeah. also, though, had, to, uh, to your point, I've, I've been in more conversations, you know, from an IT perspective with our Department of Program and Intervention, you know, the, the social workers, the psychology folks, right? And, and with SPED and, and with our school leadership team. We've literally had uh, and curriculum folks, but we've had conversations, powwows around, hey, we really need to emphasize that you can't force students to turn on their cameras because it may be um, shameful given what's happening in their home context for them, right? So how do we honor all students 
and, and at the same time engage them and find ways for them to connect mm -hmm. authentically with teachers and with students that's safe. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so it's been an interesting uh, to navigate that, yeah. Yep. Rob, it looks like a few of those um, points resonated with you, authentic and honoring and, and, and structures. So tell us what you've learned. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, I appreciate Phil uh, highlighting something not being forced. I so much would get questions from folks on, well, how are we uh, supposed to expect, you know, it, it's almost like you expect the behavior to be different for that kid in that online environment than they would be in a classroom. Do you have kids that are unengaged in the classroom? Yes. What effective strategies do you do to change that? And a lot of that has to do with the engagement of that lesson planning. So whenever I'm thinking about what we're doing and you think about, you know, if I'm gonna spend 50 minutes listening to content and it's all lecture, you know, most kids today aren't going to be that engaged. And so if you've been that teacher over the course of 10, 15 years and you are and you think you're going to just replicate that in an online setting, you know, it, it kind of goes back to our conversation about the, the number of minutes and meetings our students were at the start of the year. And so I think when you think about assessment and you think about um, that learning Every, all the activities that happen in learning and assessments, just a part of learning is that checks for understanding that Phil was talking about. Flipgrid is amazing for that uh, authentic. And I love that because kids that wouldn't have engaged before are mm -hmm. making their own videos and sending those back in the, in the modalities that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I think when, I think we give a bad rap sometimes to, that student-centered approach where we say, well, we're, we're giving too much to those students. Well, I mean, think about this. As a, as a teacher, um, you want your students to be authentically heard in the way that they want to be heard. And I think of inclusion in this. You know, we, we, we've talked about inclusion in a lot of different ways. And I think social emotionally, we have to be inclusive social emotionally too. And my daughter graduated this year from EI Academy, the virtual school that we started. And, uh, you know, I, it was her first time in a virtual school. And yet everyone else in, in the rest of the district was also pretty much virtual. And watching her as a senior not go through a regular senior year and not having those clear delineations, I, I think about the social emotional aspect of where where kids are at. And as a teacher, you have to think, okay, what are those strategies that I could do that are reflective, help my kids to reflect on how they're feeling at the time, especially in this time of uncertainty and where we're at in the world, uh, even politically. And so having those honest questions and being able to create lessons that are engaging with real world situations, we have a lot of real world situations right now. And so, um, in our professional development this year, starting in August, we did not deliver the full day of just straight up PD. It was a half a day of PD. And the other half was like practice within that professional development opportunity. And so some of that was just very intentional to help our teachers see if we modeled that for them, Maybe they would model that same practice for their students. And so I think, you know, Phil hit a lot of those areas whenever you think about being authentic and giving that feedback. I think as we look at things moving forward, when you're looking at project-based learning and some of those other modalities of, of how you can uh, make skills, and I think of, we treat digital literacy skills as something of the how, right? And when my how is taking math subjects and English subjects and I'm mixing that together in my feedback. I, I'm really doing a, a great interdisciplinary activity and teaching a lot of different content areas in one lesson. And it doesn't matter if you're in elementary or secondary, that should and can happen. And I think in secondary so much we get tied up in you know, this is my content area and I've got this much stuff to get done in the year. 
you know, I, I think it's important for us to think about the whole child today. And when you look at that, um, it means as a teacher, changing your strategy to understand what are the things help support what that kid is learning. Kathy, if I might, just because it resonates in Rob's conversation. Yeah. Our, our school systems have done such amazing work with virtual schooling, not just online learning around how do you do CTE career days and all these sorts of things. But one thing I want to call out, and I'm sure Rob, you've got the same optics. I, I get to see all the things that bubble up from a disciplinary standpoint or in Teams or in Gaggle or whatever it might be. And I got to tell you, We've got students in, in high poverty, uh, almost 100 languages spoken in Fresno, so high diversity. And the number of incidents relative to the amount of chat and connections that are going on is de minimis. Yeah. Kids mostly want to do good, mostly want to be engaged. And anyway, I, um, because unfortunately the, the, that narrative isn't, this is our future and it's just beautiful how students really do show up so often. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for mentioning that. Um, Rob, it sounds like you've got kind of greater coherence and alignment in your district between what's happening in classrooms and what's happening in just or organizational learning, learning across your district. Yeah, I, I, I totally appreciate our district leadership and understanding, um, you know, just how we all work together in, mm -hmm. in this mix to create mm -hmm. strategies that are effective, especially in this type of environment. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't like what you said about assessment. You know, I, I wonder how important the mode of assessment is if we clearly see learning and competency demonstrated. So, yeah. All right, it looks like Keisha has joined us. Keisha, can you see, can you share? Great, welcome. Hi. <laughs> All right, so Keisha, maybe you can, um, so we've been, we've been hearing from Phil and Rob about what's happening in their districts, um, specific to effective teaching and learning um, in online and remote um, instances. And so um, we'd love to hear what, what you've observed um, in your virtual travels around the country. <laughs> and can, can you give us some examples of, of what you see, have, what you have seen um, that's, that's worked well? First, just for supporting, for supporting and connecting um, communities. Right. I tell you, I am working now with several school districts. And I think the ones that, uh, and I just finished a webinar, so I am late. I just finished a webinar where we were highlighting some uh, districts who are doing flipped learning. And so I guess some examples that I have would be one in Los Angeles, they're doing a lot around SEL and just making sure that their students know that there's a place for them to be and that they can connect with their teacher anytime. Uh, they are using a learning management system to do that and making sure that teachers are holding office hours so students can check in. Of course, they're doing classes predominantly remote right now and online, but they also wanted to make sure that everything's not about instruction, that the, you know, what you would normally have in a school face-to-face -face environment where, you know, kids are in halls after school, just kind of checking in, waving, hanging out, um, that they can do that in a virtual environment. So I really admire that effort. It takes an abundance of uh, commitment for the teachers to do that because it's an extension of their day. And then, um, what I have seen in some of the flipped learning environments is the desire to really maximize the online presence um, as an extension of that physical environment that they uh, may or may, may not be having. The, the schools that, um, that I've worked with the most are in hybrid models. So they're going to school some days and online some days and trying to use that online environment consistently so that there's coherence between Monday and Friday and it doesn't feel choppy. Uh, I think that has been a brilliant use of online uh, and virtual resources. Mm -hmm. And then I guess finally, my friends and colleagues in New York City are doing really phenomenal work around rethinking what instruction can and should look like uh, for 
students who come from a variety of backgrounds with a variety of resources and really paying attention. I'll have to give a shout out for their MLEL uh, department and the special education department because they've really been super thoughtful in how students of special populations engage in virtual environments so that they can have um, the robust learning experiences that they would have in a, in a face-to-face environment. The, the whole time that you were talking, Keisha, I, I just kept thinking, maybe the guideline here is be human, show your humanity. Right. <laughs> and and that, that came through in what, in what Phil and Rob were saying as well from their district. So I appreciate those examples. Um, the, the other question that, that we talked about um, was specific to classroom practice and, and with educators, you know, working with students, um, how they have, have structured and approached um, their, their online delivery, you know, their, um, what, what they've done in their teaching and learning to help students feel engaged, feel, uh, feel that things are clear for them. Have you got some examples that you might, might be able to share about that? Well, I think, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about New York because one of the things that they did, you know, they had not ever done uh, to the extent that they have now online learning mm -hmm. uh, like they have now. And so they did a wide variety of things to make sure that every student kind of was comfortable entering at the point where they were entering. So mm -hmm. some families wanted, still wanted print material so that was provided. Some families still wanted opportunities to come together and be in person, even though there were the six foot restrictions. So mm -hmm. that was provided. They provided family care centers so that families could come and learn how to adapt to this new environment and what it meant. Um, they were very conscientious about um, using uh, interaction, using uh, their mode is Teams meetings. So using Teams meetings to interact with the students and what might be in the background. So they enabled virtual backgrounds um, and allowed the, the students to be able to create their own backgrounds. Um, and I thought that was very thoughtful for uh, them to be able to kind of meet the learners where they were in the journey to online and remote. I think, you know, what is known probably among everyone on this panel is that these practices have been in play for over 20 years. And so to our, you know, our new entries in this space, they feel a little vulnerable because it's not a space they've been in. And that's kind of where I've been working the most is with those um, districts who knew it was out there. Sometimes they didn't know that it was out there. They, they knew it was, you know, a virtual school, like in Michigan, they have a virtual school, but a lot of the districts in Michigan don't do virtual. They just kind of defer to the virtual school. Now they're having to do virtual. Mm -hmm. So I think that learning curve has been really uh, challenging for districts and challenging for teachers, mm -hmm. but I am so impressed. There's a couple of Facebook groups I'm in. One is teaching during COVID. And if you haven't joined that Facebook group, you're missing out because it is hundreds of thousands of teachers in that group. And they're all talking about cool new strategies that they've learned as they're teaching during this time. And in its veteran virtual teachers sharing their effective practices and veteran, veteran blended teachers sharing their effective practices with these teachers who have been traditional teachers most of their career. So I probably deviated from the question there. No, but. no, that's great. I, I appreciate you sharing that example. We did talk a little bit earlier about how everyone being in a digital space now has made community much more permeable and accessible. Yeah, yeah. so that's a great example. Yeah. Bill or Rob, do you want to say anything in response or to add on um, based on what you heard from Keisha before we, before we go any farther? No, Keisha has worked with districts that I have been in before, so I... Uh, Appreciate you, friend. Great. Um, and to the point that uh, I think you made, Rob, about long meetings and long classes, I want to pause <laughs> and ask our participants, um, are you getting something interesting? Have you learned something new? Is there a question that you would like to add? Um, I don't want to run out of time before we, um, before we address something that you might have on your mind. So we'll, we'll give everybody a moment um, to, to add into the chat or the Q&A. 
while Keisha and Rob and Phil think about any last um, points that they would like to make or any last um, advice that they might like to share since we're kind of closing in and into the, the end of the session. All right. Not seeing anything show up. Phil, did you want to? There we go. I'm on mute now. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, there's a picture of equity in terms of, you know, can the kids see over the fence to watch the baseball game? Shoot, they got to be playing the game. And, and we have to be playing, as Rob and I have talked about, Akisha, you talked about that as well, playing the modern game. You know, that includes social emotional learning, agency, skills, competency. But what's really become unveiled is that uh, inequity moves is also beyond the school grounds. Mm. And so we're built, building a private LTE network in Fresno Unified uh, to, you know, I'll call it project, our first, first project of that 1.4 million in terms of radios and all that to, to create connectivity for students who aren't getting it. But what we've got is at a national problem where the, those sort of access to the modern world for telehealth, telework, you know, telelearning in those homes don't exist. So we've all got to lean in to solve for that and, and, and make some big policy changes. And I think also the, the shift to virtual schooling, I'm hoping doesn't go away. You know, it doesn't rubber band back, but is an on-ramp to a really healthy future for education. And then, so the question becomes, you know, how do we create the right digital ecosystems, the right data interchange, so we can have rich learning analytics that are available to students, teachers, and, and system and school leaders as well. So those are some, other pieces that I think are real important as we move forward. Yeah, I think those are hugely important points. You're talking about everyone kind of accelerating their future readiness, mm -hmm. um, potentially. Um, and, and because we're spending more time in a digital space, we've got more data. So we can better understand what's happening in those learning experiences. We just need to kind of now uh, ramp up um, the skill that we have to, to use the data and understand, understand it. Rob, anything that you want to want to say or add or share? You know, I think that data is more timely too. Like mm -hmm. I think um, so much whenever teachers were using assessment data, it might take some time for that to get back. When you're using uh, a digital platform that gives you feedback like we're using in Class Insights, that teacher is doing that themselves. And they're seeing what students are doing uh, through that data point. And I think it helps them to just be to understand a level of engagement that maybe they didn't see before. Because I, I think sometimes when you're just seeing, you're assuming. Mm -hmm. And when you're seeing the data, many times that data is telling a different story than what, than what you're seeing visually. Mm. Yeah, so we've got tools now to sort of disintermediate data, right? Data don't, don't have to leave the classroom and go someplace else and be processed and come back to the teacher. The teacher has immediate access to all of that. I'll say one more thing and then I'll pass it to Keisha. The, 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 I think professional learning, we've learned that we can do in two hours what we used to do in eight hours and, and then do things in between. So, and we've definitely rem remind ourselves that affective, experiential, actionable are, are keys to the professional learning. And then um, the um, other piece I was going to mention is that there's no average teacher, there is no average student, and we've now got a way from a professional learning standpoint and from an educational standpoint to make sure we deliver with that knowledge. And so for one teacher, it might be, I've never used Excel before to get data. Well, let me walk with you. Let's find ways to create the right supports. Um, and let's create, you know, communities of practice. Keisha, I appreciate you mentioning the, 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 those communities of practice that are extending beyond districts as well. And uh, yeah, some exciting possibilities are in front of us. Yeah, I think, you know, the connection has not with, you know, in the past, we connected internally within our school, maybe mm -hmm. within our larger district and quite possibly, you know, like a district to another district. But now, we have a lot of parents involved in a way they've never been involved before. They're co-teachers. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of uh, businesses involved in a way they've never been involved before. They're co-developers of content. So I think, and I don't think we can turn that back. 
Mm-hmm. And I talk about that with my uh, school district clients is, you know, I, you can't invite somebody in and be like, oh, I changed my mind. You got to go. That's not going to happen. And especially we didn't invite them in for three months. We invited them in for almost two years. Mm-hmm. So you really, now you've got a habit of mind in play. Those parents are now, uh, they're committed and they're empowered. And they are a lot more in tune with the curriculum you've been teaching than they ever have been before. And we're not going to be able to unwind that. And I think we should embrace it and think about how we can in, you know, kind of engage the parent voice, the student voice, and the teacher voice. Because there's teachers that have been wanting to teach this way mm-hmm. and haven't had the opportunity to teach this way. There's other teachers that haven't wanted to teach this way, but needed, you know, I know when I used to be a tech director, you know, uh, Rob and I would talk frequently and I'd be like, oh man, I just, I wish I could just, put, you know, force some of them to try it because I think they'd like it. Well, that day has come. So now they, you know, I call it the Howard factor because there's a teacher that I work with in LA named Howard who had a flip phone when I met him. And um, I had to think about, well, how can I relate this to someone who still uses a flip phone? And he got it. He got it. He loved it. He's like the best you know, speaker on how to teach in a blended and online fashion now in LA, but he still carries a flip phone. And the, so the Howard factor is real. And I don't think we can undo that either. So I think there has been an iteration that in education that we can, you know, it's a pivot, you know, to, to um, kind of refer to Malcolm Gladwell, it's a tipping point. And we have a decision to make at the top of this tip where we're going to fall. Yeah. Great points. We've got, we've got a huge, enormous community um, now in Cajun schooling. Yeah. Um, so what, what, other than the Facebook group, um, Keisha, that you recommended, um, what, what else, what other resources or sites or communities would any of you recommend um, for, and it could be for anyone re- related to remote and blended learning, Um, for teachers, for leaders, um, or for families. Any recommendations? I would add the Microsoft Educator Network. Okay. uh, Yeah, go ahead. Don't rub. (laughs) I'd say the distance learning playbook is a great one for teachers to look at and just be mindful of whenever they're developing things. I think it's a great Hattie and Doug Fisher and them did a great job on that. Yeah. Good one. Uh, I'm going to refer you to DLAC, um, which is um, the website. I'll put it in chat, but the website is D-E-E-L-A-C.com, DLAC. And that's a really a group of practitioners uh, that come together and uh, celebrate virtual and online learning. But you don't have to be a virtual and online teacher to be part of it. So you know, that's going to happen in uh, Austin in June. And then um, also, of course, the tech and learning uh, community is alive and well. And that's one um, that I try to feed uh, every, every week and give them good resources uh, and such. And then I have K20 Connect, which is, um, I send a newsletter out every month to give information about these resources and many other and research that's coming out. And there's a lot of really great research that's coming out in support of what we're doing that um, is not only related to um, to virtual and online, but screen time. Um, Some new studies have shown that when you are engaged in a screen for homework and academics, that it really doesn't have the same impact as other engagements with the screen. So uh, there's a lot of really positive research coming out that um, that promotes what we've been trying to prove for decades. Very good. All right, last words from anyone? This has been jam-packed, fantastic. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I was just gonna say, keep leaning into collaborative practices with your students. They need mm-hmm. the social connections and it's building a skill set that we so need in terms of our civic uh, environment for people to actually solve problems together and learn how to respect each other's uh, differences and work on some common good and, and some common task uh, together. So yeah, keep, keep driving in that direction. 
Thanks. All right, I appreciate everything that you all have shared, um, all of your insights and wisdom. Um, I think that there's still probably plenty more, um, but and uh, you, you shared some of your favorite resources. So we've got lots of ways to continue learning. So thank you so much for, for being here and sharing um, what you've learned. Thanks for inviting us. Yes, thank you so much for being here today. Your presentation was fabulous. There was a lot of rich information and um, we will certainly share this information on the edtrendsremoteed.org website uh, for those of you who are with us. Um, so I just want you to know that you can refer to that site and we will place these resources that have been recommended onto the site uh, so that other educators and parents also have access who weren't able to join today as well. This video will become available on edtrends.org. So we ask that you, um, if you wish to revisit this uh, presentation or any information from this presentation, you will be able to do so um, in, within the next few days. Thank you again uh, for serving as our panelists and Kathy Cavanaugh for as our moderator. And until next week, health and happiness. <laughs>